I'm Torsten. Torsten here at the Silicon Valley based in San Francisco for Key Venture. Um, we invest anything from very early stage, like $50,000 um, priced rounds, um, participation in early stage rounds to my recent round was $50 million in a mezzanine investment. And um, we do anything that has some sort of synergies with those telecom that either they can use internally or sell to their customers or creates a new market. So it doesn't need to be something that Deutsche Telekom is actually using or selling. It can be something that really promotes a widespread um, uptake rate on their existing services or creates a whole new market for telecommunications. And so that means I'm, I'm more focused on the B2B side and cloud computing side, infrastructure, transportation. So I'm very interested on the billing side and distribution side of apps, on the wholesale part of apps, um, while my colleagues are more on the consumer side. And we're just four people here in the US and another 16 um, back in Germany with about a $1.2 billion under management and uh, do only about 20 investments per year. And so hopefully we'll get into platform talk, but you're yeah. across platform. Right? I think yeah. all of you are, yeah. actually. Great. Yeah. My name is Jeff Tannenbaum. I'm with a firm called Blue Run Ventures. We're located in Menlo Park with offices also in China and Korea. We focus primarily on everything that empowers mobile uh, mostly consumer-facing technologies. And uh, that's everything from apps to back-end uh, architecture and the building blocks for mobile. Uh, nothing hardware-related. And we primarily focus on seed and Series A investing. Um, my name is Nuno Mosal Shapiro. I'm uh, with Key Capital. I'm one of the managing partners there. Uh, we focus on consumer mobile applications. So B2C and B2C2B, I'll come back to that later. Um, we only do very early stage, so seed um, series here probably in the Bay Area would be seed series and we also do series A in other parts of the world. Typically 50 to 60 percent of our investments would be in the Bay Area and the other part would be anywhere else in the world. We have a portfolio company in Beijing, one in Tokyo just, just filed for IPO and uh, we have other investments in the U.S. Um, we are uh, sort of new kids on the block, we started in San Mateo. Uh, we follow the crowd, so we're now our key offices in San Francisco, uh, off, mm -hmm. off Embarcadero, because that's where all the cool, cool kids are. Um, and my background's in mobile. I'm an old mobile head, 16 years. I uh, was the head of strategy, corporate and business development for the GSM Association, which is the global trade association that tried to fight the fight for the carriers. And after that, I was with McKinsey in Asia for six years. Was I butchering your name? It's Say it again? I'm sorry. Uh, Gonçalves, but we can go with Nuno. Nuno's good, yeah. Nuno? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And I'm Alistair. I'm uh, editor of Thompson Reuters, and I uh, cover venture capital for uh, ECJ and uh, PE Hub. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for uh, hanging out here during the day. Just a quick call. I'm always curious, uh, you know, from the consumer perspective, what you guys are, <coughs> are using here. So show of hands, uh, iPhones? More than half, almost three quarters. Um, uh, Android, I have to lift up my, my hand. Okay. Um, Blackberry? I have to lift up my hand. It's just this corner. <laughs> they told us to sit all together, right? Yeah, multiple phones. I have to hold up my hand. Yes. Oh, yeah, quite a few. Uh, what did I leave out? Windows? The independence with again, right? Always oh, like. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay, right. Um, well, so, I mean, there's our audience. Uh, not, not too unexpected, but start us off, guys. I mean, where, where, are you seeing, um, where are you seeing developments and innovation, and where's the money going? Who wants to. Happy to, happy to start. So we still think there is tremendous opportunity in the consumer uh, mobile space. Um, I know we're, we're sitting around here talking about how many apps are in the app store right now, and it's daunting <coughs> and a bit overwhelming, but uh, there's, the innovation is really just beginning. Going beyond you know, games, which are great, and that's what fills up most of the app store, um, the opportunity in mobile in my, in my opinion, is still in context aware everything. And that next generation of intelligent app, um, and very few companies have even begun touching on that. So it's those companies that figure out how to leverage these basic elements such as where I was, where I am right now, where I'm headed, combining that with date and time, 
Can you give an example? Is there one off the top of your head? Where uh, you've no, no, no. Right so, so well, I mean, we have, we have investments in um, probably most notably because it's been in the news recently a lot is this company called Waze, W A Z E, and it's a map. It's a mapping company. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're doing really well and getting a lot of notoriety because of the whole Apple mess up with their mapping on the new mm -hmm. iOS. But um, the data that Waze captures, right, you know, all these points of all these people traveling and being able to figure out traffic patterns, um, you know, it's brilliant. It's brilliantly simple, but brilliant. And just like that's just the tip of the iceberg. Imagine what you can do on an individual basis, knowing people's patterns. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying Waze is doing this, but the potential of other apps and being able to really give us intelligent data, whether it's a food app that just knows our basic eating habits based on where we are on a, you know, traveling every day, and it knows our cycles of how we eat, what we like to eat, when we actually get hungry. Does food spotting? Food, food spotting doesn't, but there's tremendous, yeah, food spotting is one of our investments. Um, food spotting is probably comparable to a Yelp, um, mm -hmm. except it's very visual, very rich imagery around mm -hmm. food. It's for food, people that are very passionate about food. Uh, but so there's tons of opportunity with context, and um, but I'm I, always looking for that. But I feel that the, the device manufacturers and, and carriers kind of left us alone there, right? Because we're always talking about apps and applications, and, and there should be more context aware and location aware. And then I look at my device, and unfortunately, if I actually enable GPS and Wi-Fi and NFC and all of these things, and actually get used, after an hour, my battery is empty. Mm -hmm. Right? There were sure. uh, South by Southwest. There were a couple of these things. Oh yeah. Where, like everyone was like looking for the plugs because after an hour, your phone had to be charged right. again. So we're investing in a couple of technologies that are actually on the silicon level, as well as the infrastructure level, the kernel level, as well as the lower tier application enablers, you know, that actually enable you to run location-based services and interactions. So that's wonderful. These kind of we need that. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the kind of technology that is going to just open up a world of opportunity which, for all of us. Which is also an opportunity because, the, I mean, if you look at device manufacturers, their cycles are 18, 18 months, 20 months, right, to release a device to go through FCC certification. And if you actually can do that on a software level, you know, that becomes really efficient because then you can actually really innovate faster and fail faster and create more things. I, I think I, that's a good point. I would say the, the biggest innovation is obviously <coughs> mobile is different. Um, there's going to be a lot of categories around fitness, well-being, mm -hmm. and many other areas of productivity that will be fundamentally transformed. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest innovation that we're seeing is actually in how companies work, right? And uh, if we look at what agile software development has done for software management mm -hmm. in general, to push products in an iterative way, to actually get feedback from end users much, much more quicker, quickly, and also embedded into the whole process itself, what we end up seeing at this stage is that I think is, that is also going into marketing. It's going into sales. Companies are becoming agile actually end to end, right? And uh, it is phenomenal to see small companies with three, four people that are doing marketing or ROI from a, a very analytical and scientific perspective when you look at companies that have sometimes tens of thousands of people that don't do it. And I, I think that is an incredible innovation. And it's an innovation because of need. It's not an innovation because they wanted to do it, but they don't have enough money to spend on getting you know, the right amount of downloads and, and retention. So for me, that I think is the most phenomenal innovation. It's an operational model innovation that is happening with many of the startups you see in the mobile app space. Any specific sectors, though, is, um, uh, I mean, we've seen gaming in the last couple of years. Anything related to like uh, fashion and shopping? I thought that was interesting, though. We saw yeah. a comment about how more people are using um, their phones for purchase decisions. So, uh, yes. yeah, as far as shopping goes, with just the, the the success of tablets and proving that tablets are whatever, just going to eliminate the PC altogether, mm -hmm. right? And oh, hopefully one day even the laptop. Uh, you're going to be sitting on the couch, you're going to be lying in bed, and you're going to be shopping. And the shopping experience is entirely different than your experience on your desktop or your laptop computer. You know, your, your laptop is filled with all these links and tons of little thumbnails and it's, it's cluttered. Whereas your tablet experience is rich, super high resolution stock photographs, the swipe motion or whatever those touch motions are, and the ability to just be sold on a product a visually rich product, like using something like Retina Display, right? That you just want to almost touch it and buy it. And we're seeing that more and more people are shopping on their tablets, and we're still at the beginning of that. 
but that 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 curve is just going to escalate at a very high rate. Does, how many people here have an iPad or is planning on getting a mini iPad? So the the, pro right, the, pro sorry, the problem with it though is you look at the way most like you know you have websites that you can go to on your iPad. Uh, whatever, any site for that matter, it's an e-commerce site, and they're terrible sites. Like, they're not designed around iPad mm -hmm. or a tablet. And so right now you're dissuaded from shopping on the iPad. But more and more there's apps emerging every day or there's sites emerging that are formatting the content in such a vivid, rich format that you want to make the purchases on iPad. And you're going to start seeing more of that. And there's opportunity there. I think, I think for me, the advent of retail, uh, of uh, verticalized plays in, in applications is, is really exciting. We start seeing stuff within subcategories of fitness that are interesting to people. I think what we didn't realize is when people start having a plethora of services that they can use on the mobile device, uh, they actually are going to do a lot more activities because the mobile device is linked to many more activities in your life. It's always with you. And so I think the emergence of vertical plays is fantastic and it's great for everyone involved. It solves a lot of the problems around advertising. Advertising can be fundamentally targeted because it's segmental at the end of the day. Um, it also solves issues around, for example, monetization directly into the app or just for the app itself because if people are willing to pay, it's something they want to do with it. And for me, we see that as really a, a very interesting thing. So everyone sometimes is trying to address the issue a little bit from the horizontal standpoint, having end-to-end -end solutions. I think we'll see the emergence of a lot of point solutions that will work really well for a large portion of users, and that will do really well in the marketplace. You, I'll come to you in a moment. Any examples? Yeah. Any no, I mean, I won't tell you names of specific companies. Okay. We've looked at a lot. Um, I think, for example, the fitness app, if you look anything from weightlifting to actually anything that is at the other edge related to dieting and the ability to lose weight, which someone like me clearly needs, um, you know, anything in that spectrum is really exciting and we see guys who are doing really well. We haven't found anything that we decided to invest in just in terms of maturity, but what we are seeing in terms of product is really, really, really cool stuff. I have one for you. Yes. We're not an investor in it, but I kind of look at it and I say, wow, I, I wish I would have known about this company. It's called Strava. I don't know if anyone's oh, heard of them. The biking. The biking and the running app. So I, li I live and die by it. Yeah. It's beautifully designed. It's really fun to use. Yeah, it's really fun to use. And the basic gist of this app, speaking to your point, mm -hmm. is they've just reinvented exercise. So it, they leverage very simply the GPS in your phone. And I use it when I go out on my bike. I, turn, I hit start, it tracks my entire biking pattern. And the coolest part is they've added one element, which is the social element. So when I get back from my ride, I can pull up essentially, a, it's like a leaderboard and it tells me every segment of my ride that I did and who in my community like I'm ranked against. And I used to think I was like a decent biker, but it turns out that like I'm thousand on the leaderboard compared to other people in my community. I'm like the slowest biker in the world. But anyway, it's revealed data that was just, it was always there. And, but we never knew it existed. So Strava is an, an amazing example of just leveraging one element on your phone, which is GPS. Mm -hmm. And the best part is, remember, your phone goes everywhere with you now, right? So I'm always looking for apps that are just taking advantage of the phone always being in our pocket or in our purse and what you can do with that data. And Strava is a great example. Absolutely. And yeah, weight loss apps and all those things, mm -hmm. right? Knowing your eating habits. Yeah. I think yeah, I, that's a, also a great example that many, uh, too many app developers. Um, I'm not sure how to put this on that, but many app developers are very young, right? They grew up with the first device and they start developing, and they're reinventing the wheel, right? It's not like these kind of problems have never been there before. We have never shocked before, right? right? So a lot of them are just thinking about, oh, what would look cool or what would be great, but they don't know metrics. They don't know what to measure, when right. to measure. They haven't looked at business logic. How do I actually sell it? Who actually signs my check? Are you referring to YC companies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Actually, <laughs> it is like it's it, it's a it's a real problem because in this moment you create a huge like velocity of applications and very little sticks and because it's so cheap to start nowadays. Of course. You know, then you have to educate the a lot of the people again. Okay, so did you think about you know how how to leverage this data, how do you get the data out, what's the value of the data, how can you make it valuable, and that's a big data problem, that's, you know, that's, that's a, been around for a long time, 
you know, big data 20 years ago, you know, might have been only like, let's say, a gigabyte or 20 gigabyte. We're still a big data problem. Now it's petabyte, right? So there's telecom per day about six to nine petabyte of data collected. Right? That's, that's a lot of stuff to back up and, and process. And um, I think that's um, when we invest into a company, we try to really make sure that they can execute on that vision and not just think, hey, I've got a nice app. Yep. I don't know how to measure it, but you know, it's going to be good. And you make a good point. <laughs> no, no, you really do. There's, there, that, I think that's, it's an interesting point because there's a <coughs> lot of stuff that comes out where you're right. It's just, they're not fully baked ideas. And um, there's no real business model behind it. But, but that's not necessarily bad for a venture capitalist, I guess, right? <laughs> we Why? have choice because, sure. I mean, we, we looked at this in 2011 for every 15 rounds of angel investment, there was one round of venture capital investment. There is a chasm. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if 15 so is the right. Sorry, I didn't get for that. every 15 angel rounds yes. of investment, there will be one venture mobile, capital round of investment. <laughs> Right. This is overall, so it's, okay. it's not okay. just for mobile apps. Okay. I don't know if that's the right ratio in terms of should it be six or should it be 15 right. or 10, but it doesn't seem like a bad thing. I mean, at the end of the day, no, people the, will make choices. But right? the problem is that our VC model, the traditional VC model, is not adjusted to that kind of velocity. I'm, I'm not a traditional yeah, VC, so exactly. I'm so, happy. <laughs> so I see a lot of people who come to me as a last straw almost, right? So we are yeah. no name yeah. in the valley. I don't, you know, we are, have a super big presence in Europe. We're very well, well known, but you probably know Andreessen and Indexcel and you know Index. You probably don't know T-Venture so well. So um, fact is, that a lot of people say, you know, I went to every one of them, and they just like wave me away. You know, they see a thousand of them, and guess what? They obviously take the ones that already had like four or five or six startups and had already like four or five or six exits, and then they say, here, give you the money. I don't even care anymore what you're doing. Right? I trust your execution, and that becomes really, really difficult. So what's m what's missing in the VC community? So where is the money going? are early exits, mm -hmm. a VC model that actually is more of an HR recruiting, remixing model. So one of the biggest complaints is always saying, do you have an iPhone developer? Do you have this kind of developer? Do you know someone who has this one, right? I get this call all the time from my portfolio companies. And I think there's a, there's a real need there. So why not have an early stage model where um, you actually have very often early exits or early conversions into new company configurations because that would really benefit everyone. And um, I think there's no model yet for that to be incentivized from a VC perspective. I need a hundred million dollar revenue company, you know, in my corporate VC. It's, mm -hmm. it's not possible to do 400 early stage exits for me. I'm not going to pay my fund back with that. Right. And um, very few VCs can take um, dividends, right, on, <laughs> on lifestyle companies. But we're seeing more and more uh, micro VCs emerge. Yeah. And you put yourself in that category, yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. So there's, and I, I'd imagine it, that your fund economics are a little different. Our fund economics are a little bit different. Uh, our approach to the market and thesis is a bit different. So we, actually most of our deal flow is outbound. So for us to have 1.4 million apps to choose from is actually great because that's our deal. That's the beginning of our deal flow. Obviously, we then need to qualify it, but still to be around the thousands of apps as qualified propositions, it's interesting. So we're mostly outbound. We just basically reach out to startups that we think are having traction. We are very analytics driven uh, to get to that point. Um, and secondly, as you said, and correctly, obviously, we write small checks. Uh, we want the team to be lean, but to already have some track record. So in some ways, there's self-selection, right? If you're a hotshot Silicon Valley entrepreneur, the likelihood we'll work with you is maybe smaller. But at the end of the day, you know, the likelihood that we'll work with a company that has uh, maybe in the low millions of downloads that is doing really well, probably already doing $400,000, $500,000 a year is very high and that we get friendly valuations for that. So we believe our space is here and, and that's what we aim for. Uh, I agree with you. I think there are things in traditional VC that are broken. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have tried different things, having their own HR, sort of shared services at, at mm -hmm. the middle to help other companies. Like Andreessen, uh, for example. Andreessen Horowitz is trying things like that, also successful. trying things now around product. Um, so I think we have to have respect for people that are trying new things and trying to adapt with times. I think it is time to adapt. Uh, we started with no legacy, so in some ways we have the benefit of trying something fully new and, and just seeing how it goes, and it's been going quite well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to go back to the analytics uh, point a moment ago because I just uh, was talking with Nick's panel 
Um, they're, you know, along the same lines of a flurry, I guess, or an absolute. I mean, they all have different, well, flurry's kind of a bit larger, I guess, but they all provide mobile analytics. I mean, is there, um, can you go back to your point of what you were trying to say about analytics? Is the, I mean, there's, there's space to improve there? Yeah, so the, the worst thing that I always hear is as soon as I ask them about analytics, they say, all we use, and then comes any sort of company, right? right? It doesn't, doesn't help, right? So it's like saying, I'm going to build Amazon, and I'm going to use a traditional e-commerce store that's available you know, over the web. If, if, this is not, if, if this is your core competency to do data analytics, why the world would you choose an off-the-shelf product that everyone else can use as well and get the same analytics out? Right? So you need to have something that's very specific to your vertical, something very specific to your product, something very specific, um, a, a, a way of, of gauging interactions. Yes, you can also use the tools to get you the numbers, but that alone won't help. You know, these are just numbers. You need to make sense out of them. So what is the trend? Um, is the trend something that looks like this for you? You know, maybe you're running cycles, so you're happy that it goes up and down, right? Um, is the trend, um, is, is it about monthly users? Is it about um, churn rate? Is it about active users where it actually downloads? You know, how many people come back? Um, I think that's very, very difficult, and it needs to be decided by startup. Mm -hmm. So, it's ahead, uh, so I'll, I'll see a lot of companies, um, these are app companies, uh, that they, they'll come to you and they'll, the first thing, sort of, their metric out of their mouth is, well, you know, we have this many downloads. <laughs> and, you know, and that's fine. The, and these are to kind of to speak to your point. So maybe they're vanity, some, uh, they're, vanity metrics. They're but but they're they're a little maybe inexperienced, or at least the way they're presenting it comes across a little inexperienced. Because well, some of them will be like, well, we have five thousand downloads. We want to talk to a venture capitalist, and you know that's fine, but it's not enough to be significant, at least not in this app economy that we're living in, right? Like these days, I don't have an exact number, but like. I don't even get too excited unless I hear something like a million, or like, you know? And I'll tell you what, like, I don't know, a year ago maybe that was a half million it seemed interesting, but now it's like a million. But even downloads just doesn't matter. It's exactly. like the metrics, it's like, it's like exactly what you were saying. Like, if we're dealing with gaming, it's like session time or just different, right? Session time. Sorry, we, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but just we look basically at traction, which is what you, or take up, which is what you mentioned, which is downloads and rankings, etc. We look at basically sentiment, which is not only ratings, like but review, also written reviews. reviews. We do natural language processing analysis on some of the stuff. Do you? Uh, what do you not ourselves. We, we work with a couple of people. Because there's an interesting opportunity yeah. there, right? All these comments in the app store, like, what Absolutely. does it all mean? There's a couple of right? interesting players in that space. Uh, and then we obviously look at the two most important ones, as anyone in Zynga would probably would tell you, which is retention and engagement, right? Yep. Uh, they call it re-engagement. We, we split it. But again, uh, you know, retention is really the active usage. And engagement is the stuff you're talking about, active yeah. sessions per user per month, that's it. So no, for us, that's there, the four areas. There, there are a couple of apps space. that are wildly successful, um, like track your pregnancy. Obviously, I'm not the target group, and obviously the pregnancy <coughs> only lasts nine months, mm -hmm. so you have a very, you know, a lot of engagement in that time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, so this engagement can be very different from an engagement in the game, can exactly. be very different sure. from the, so tracking that alone doesn't, doesn't really matter. And yeah. to your point, like, people say, I add 50,000 users every month. So I'm saying, so basically your, your growth sure. rate is declining. But, but right? I, I, Because I, next month, I think you have a bigger, bigger user rate. So it's basically going like this, right? Uh, I, I, I think, Thorsten, in, in some ways, there's, there's two angles. We try and help also the startups. Even before we decide mm -hmm. to invest or not, we decide we help them on what metrics matter. And you know, should, some of them are not even doing any analytics. Mm -hmm. So you know, you should do analytics. This is how you do it. This is what you should use, mix yeah, panel or whatever, really et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but also, I think the second point I would make is I think it is also our responsibility and the responsibility of investors in general, be it angel investor, venture capitalists, et cetera, to ask for those numbers and say these are the numbers that matter to me because you are in the period tracking space, et cetera, uh, or you're in the basically mobile social gaming space, right? So I, th I think that's basically a little bit the responsibility also of the investor of educating. Uh, this is basically being created from scratch. So it's quite difficult, uh, I think, for everyone to have the answer and the right taxonomy to address I could, I could ask more questions, uh, but I know we're running low on time. Any, anyone from the audience? Yes, Tim. Uh, so it's interesting that you say you see app developers reinventing the wheel. I think that's true. 
uh, as an app developer, I see platform companies reinventing the wheel. Oh yeah, so and especially especially telecoms are yes. really good at that. So if you look at a company like Intel, which <coughs> isn't really in the phone or particularly the tablet market, but there's Tizen, Tizen, excuse me. What would you suggest to them? So like Apple by analogy was losing in the PC market, so it created a new category for tablets with the iPad. So if somebody's not making it into the top tier of the tablet market, what are your ideas for telling, a, suggesting to a big company like Intel to do? In, Intel is a special beast because they, their chipsets and intellectual property, you know, and licensing of IP is across like a lot of different devices. You know, every washing machine probably has an Intel chipset inside, right? If you think about that, that's a very powerful thing because now you can actually come back to the lower platform things that you can offer. You can you can make more services that are currently services on the top. You can actually be, make this a chipset feature, like running code, like on ARM chipsets is one example, right? Like uh, having an ASIC part within your traditional um, chipset that you can program and use for cryptography or for um, location services or for Bluetooth or for near field or for um, radio wire detection. There's a company called Nuair called uh, making a, a really cool platform that basically detects um, wireless signals, nothing else, doesn't, doesn't send anything. But just by knowing what kind of wireless signals are around, you get a really good sense where you actually are. Not geographically, if you don't turn on GPS, but you know, if I'm here, my wireless reception from the wireless networks around will probably be very, very different from when I stand over there. Right, because of the location. And these are the features that need to migrate into the chips that so you're not really including a very important element. So, I mean, that's very that's valuable, but I think that the explosion of the PC and the explosion of the iPad exists because they open those products to developers and you have big ecosystems of developers in both cases. So, can we think of like another thing? Can I have yet another platform that I could write apps for that's not iPhones and PCs and tablets? What might that be? Television. Washing machines at home? I, you know, why can't this doesn't seem like a Washing machine. Can you the dishes, you know? Why can't you No, but I think I'm not sure I can't speak for Intel, right? Um, no, on the no. telecom what we are in general but telecoms are really good at pr producing network services or <coughs> making things on a very large scale of GSM, GSM networks is, is one of these examples you know, where in, in Europe network perception is much better because we actually all decided on one single standard you know, much faster than in the US and that gave us a huge cost advantage, right? I mean the, the cost to produce a telecom, a telecom an MMS, just already like a, a, a message that actually has a picture attached, a zero dot and then comes six, six zeros and then comes a number. And that's the dollar amount that actually, you know, pays and you pay 23 cents per day. So that's a good profit margin, right? Um, and these kind of things you can do, you can, for example, the whole software-defined network area, which is going to become very important if you talk about enterprise applications, where you want to have access for your own applications, and on the fly, because you just joined as an outsourcer in another company, you want to be part of their virtual private network. That's really fucking hard right now. Right? That's a whole month process, and that would be so much faster if, if there would be an underlying platform that would do that for you. I know we have to wrap this up. Um, oh, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> no, that's all right. We, it's a good thing to, to want to talk. What about um, uh, in the enterprise? You know, we're seeing more. Uh, you know, bring, bring your own devices that kind of uh, growing uh, security concerns. Are you guys seeing, you know, money going into the enterprise apps? Is that is that a growth there? I mean, of course, you can probably speak. I think it's fascinating what you see, as I said at the beginning, I wanted to come back to it just in anticipation of the question, but it's uh, sort of the B2C to B space. So basically, you're selling effectively enterprise type applications to end users first. Uh, the example I was actually giving at lunch is just an expense report application. You take a picture of it, it translates into an expense report. You put it back into your company system, but you've paid for it. Uh, and, and that generates so many opportunities for a small company. You can do lead generation from this that is much cheaper because once you have five guys on the same company, you can go to the CIO and say, I don't need to demo for you. This is already in production and it's working for your system. I think that's creating a huge amount of opportunities that are pretty fascinating and it's all coming from the app space. Jeff, any final thoughts on the end of the
No, no not on the not on the other side. The, the Dropbox is a good example of that, where you basically have this shift in enterprise applications and what you expect from your enterprise applications just because Dropbox came out to be really easy to use and yeah. had a huge impact on enterprise. Any other uh, questions? Uh, so, I can't believe it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's that? The wine. <laughs> <laughs>